Welcome to the Grace of Eugene podcast. We exist to help every person in our sphere of influence to encounter Christ, experience biblical community, and extend God's kingdom. You can learn more about us at gracecityeugene.com. Here's the podcast. Well, hello, Grace City family. Welcome to another edition of the Extended Cut. With me again, Pastor Chris. What is up? Hello, hello. Good to be here with you. Likewise. Uh, We're going to do our (coughs) usual thing here. We're going to dive into Sunday's sermon. It's from our Advent sermon series, the the finale, if you will. It's the The finale. The final theme, uh, considering joy. Um, it's we've we've been going through Advent, which talks about these four different themes, and this was the final one. And uh, so uh, we'll give just a spoiler warning here. If you have not listened to the sermon, go check it out. Uh, you'll find it on our podcast, YouTube, uh, wherever it is that you're probably listening to this. You can find it on there. So go find that. Uh, but first, before we go any further, let's just do a little recap. What did we talk about on Sunday? A little recap. Well, we talked about... Um, the concept of joy, obviously. And I introduced kind of the sermon talking about this concept of joy to the world Mm -hmm. and this Christmas carol that is so uh, prevalent and like everybody knows it. Whether you're like in the church or out of the church, you've heard the song Joy to the World. In fact, we've all heard it so much that it's probably, we're probably a little numbed to the significance of the words of the song. And then I said, you know, it reminds me of the shepherds in Luke chapter 2 and their encounter with um, the heavenly hosts and, and all of that. And I talked about how, isn't it interesting that God would choose these shepherds to bring this news to, um, to be some of the first folks to really, besides, you know, obviously like Mary and Joseph and that whole thing, to, to hear of this coming joy and this good news that would come and um, the fact that they were outcasts socially, yeah. like they were considered ceremonially unclean. They were functionally living in an exile from their socio, like economic and social, you know, cultural um, atmosphere that the rest of the citizens of their, their nation would have lived in. They smelled bad. They were always with these animals. It wasn't like, oh, cool, you're a sheep farmer. It was like, nah, you live with sheep right, in the right. field, right? And that God would choose the lowly and the outcast and the isolated to reveal the initiation of his his redemptive work here on earth too. And um, these shepherds have every reason to count or consider their lot in life as one that would lack happiness and joy and lack good circumstances. Yet this whole scenario like that caused them to rejoice Hmm. and that rejoicing is just this internal or external manifestation or expression of joy right it's like oh i'm I'm rejoicing that the joy is coming out of me or leaping within me if you will and so we talked about this difference between circumstantial happiness and eternal joy and that our circumstances can be dismal but our joy can still be dominant. Yeah. And I just, I think the, the fact that this happened through the shepherds really helps to illuminate this and that we are called to focus on um, eternal truth for our joy, not like the, the temporal circumstances yeah. and how focusing on eternal joys will always outshine the circumstances of our life that may not cause us to mm. <laughs> rejoice. Um, then we talked about the reasons we have to rejoice and the reasons are very much like, you know, theological, biblical truths. Like these are reasons why we rejoice, what we focus on that are our eternal truths. And that's the fact that Jesus is King, Mm -hmm. that he's savior, that he's a redeemer and that he's the hero of our story and of this redemptive work happening here on earth. Mm. So I love it. That was great. (coughs) No, it was a great message. And, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that that element of starting with the shepherds and and what a cool theme. I mean, something you could trace back to all throughout the Bible story is that God is constantly choosing those who other people would deem as insignificant, as uneducated, as uh, not appropriate sources to to be the ones to go spread. That's who he picks, yeah. and that's that's pretty cool to see that. I, I, I really appreciated. That. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I really appreciated that uh, that highlight in that. 
Well, let's dive into some of our, our questions here. What was something that uh, was maybe difficult for you as yeah. you were putting together this message? And obviously we talked about this beforehand, but this idea of um, coming into the last theme and it really caused me to recognize all the overlap between themes. Because you're like, oh, this, oh, wait, I, I talked about that already. And maybe it was not specifically the same way, but conceptually. And so trying to be disciplined in like, no, let's let's nail down a different nuance of this instead of just regurgitating the last yeah. three weeks and packaging it in a different paper. Sure. Um, and so uh, joy really is kind of a, a culmination of a lot of those other things. Yeah. Like, I have hope. I am loved. God gives me peace. And those things cause joy. Yeah. Right? Those, I could have said, here's the things we have that we can rejoice in. We have hope. Right. <laughs> right? God is love. And we have peace because of him when we cast our minds on his presence instead of the things that, like, we feel lacking in. Those are the eternal truths. And, like, we could have said that. I, I, I didn't because, again, I didn't want to just yeah. regurgitate. But the reality is joy is an expression of all of those things becoming solidified right. in our in our hearts. And so um, it wasn't, like, hard, like, oh, I don't like this. It was just like, okay. I, it, it challenged me a little sure. to to make sure and draw those lines. That's a cool way of framing it, though, because I that was honestly, like, as we were planning this, like, I... I made the case that I said, I think joy should be at the end because like, just to be transparent, there is no super clear way of how Advent should be like remembered. You could look and see some different churches and you'd say like, oh, weird. They did that theme here and they did this theme at the end and different like spoiler alert. There's no really clear, like, because this is just a kind of a vague tradition that's been picked up over time like no one's ever been like and these are the four themes right. in the order that there's you no do canonized them. advent order exactly yeah. and so um i i thought that was a really cool aspect of this that like joy comes at the end of this and the culmination i love that that's how you put that like of all these truths mm-hmm. is like the result of joy and rejoicing moving forward yeah. so that's really cool um, what brought you joy in putting together this sermon? What brought you joy in talking about joy? <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was kind of a, an ancillary thing. It wasn't actually about the message. Yeah. Um, I mentioned it in my exor- beginning worship exhortation, and this is no secret to you, but like, I'm not a huge Christmas carol guy. Right. And the fact that I have to start hearing them, like, in October, you know, <laughs> and that they dominate. I, I Normally, I love listening Christian radio. Like, I'm learning new songs that I can lead as I lead worship. It just ministers to my soul, and it suppresses road rage and all those other things while yep. I'm driving around. And then Christmas music takes it over. <laughs> just like, man. And so I usually have a really poor attitude about it. But... In preparing this message and doing it through the lens of a Christmas carol and digging into the the rich theological like uh, hymnness, it's not really a word. But, That's right. It works. Um, of a lot of these Christmas yeah. carols, it's like, oh my gosh, this is more of a devotion yeah. than a fickle song that we sing because of a season. Yes. And I think you could find me like humming or singing Joy to the World in July just as much as I would in December, not because of its proximity to Christmas, but because of the potency of the gospel. It's yeah. And so that was really fun for me. And obviously it spilled out of me in the, hey, don't y'all have bad attitudes about singing three Christmas carols today <laughs> because this is gospel, you know? Yes. Um, I didn't say it just like that. But um, so that was that was a fun little nugget that yeah. no one would ever know if I didn't tell you. But that's sure. just, those are the things that, that happen as, as you dig into this process of, of preparing to to deliver God's word and share his heart with and for the people that he's entrusted me every week. So oh, that's cool. No, and I, I have seen that shift, that change in, in you over the past couple of years. I remember my <laughs> like first Christmas being down here saying like, oh hey, like I think we should start doing songs like first week of December. Like and we'll just kind of slowly build in. And I remember there was like a little bit of pushback to be like, I'm not ready for Christmas. Like Christmas is four weeks away. At this Let me point. get through my birthday first. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but over time, that has become like 
there's been less tension in that because I, I, I've seen in you like a reason to celebrate. And there has been this shift in recognition. And, yeah. and I think it's something we can all continue to grow in every year. I mean, uh, for that opening sermon that I did in this series, I had never known the like historical and theological significance of the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Right. And that was something I discovered by like Goog- simply Googling the song. And, like, read this article about this, like, deep, profound history about it. And it just brought this sense of appreciation and joy to it that wasn't there before. And that, that yeah. was a really cool change for me. I think the longer we're around church, there's kind of two paths that just the cult, church culture can take us down. And one is it can take us down this path of, like, you just you become numb to some of the, the depth of certain things that we engage in. Yeah. And you just treat it as, like... I don't know the word, but it, as if it's it becomes less significant over time. Yeah. Or the other way is you can like allow it to actually shape you and grow you and become more deeply rooted. And so there's Christian sayings that I used to like just reject. Like, oh my gosh, there's that again. Right? Yeah. I'm, I can tell you if I'm going through this, somebody in my life group is going to give me this response and this response because that's what Sunday school taught them. You know. Yeah. And as time goes on, it's like. Those things through maturing in Christ actually have way more meaning yeah. than they did in, in my more immature years, and I have not reached any level of any sort. But I think that's a sign of yeah. like growing in Christ and really grasping the good news of these things is like, nah, we're not throwing that one out. Right. There's a reason it's been around for over 300 years, right? And, um, and I think that there's power in those things, and it's not because of its tradition. But its actual theological significance has caused it to stick yes. around, not just because, oh, that's what the church does. Right. And I think we have an opportunity to discern between those things and actually carry them out and pass them down to my kids. I'm convicted. Like, I want my kids to know what they're singing about, not yeah. just do it because it's on the radio or something. And so right. I think we have a huge opportunity with those sort of things. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, there's a reason why it sticks. Right. And why it's been around. Yeah. Uh, that's really good. And I just think, too, like, we, we don't like things that are too repetitive. It's like, I, I got it. Let me move on. I got it. Let me move on kind of thing. But as we've talked about, I think even in recent weeks, there is a difference in like knowing something and like knowing something at like the core of who you are that it actually impacts how you act and how you live and how you respond. Yeah. Like there's a difference in a surface level of knowledge and like a true like shaping knowledge mm-hmm. that actually like changes you. Yeah. There's something about like oversimplified things that in this day and age where we're just really prideful about how much we know and how learned we are and the books we read and everybody's always trying to find a new cutting edge way to present data material, make it stimulate your brain more. And at the end of the day, it's like gospel's a gospel, Yep. you know? And so I've come to appreciate much more, um, simplicity in some yeah. of this stuff instead of trying to find new packaging all the time. Like, no, it doesn't need it. Yeah. You know, it doesn't require it. Sure. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we talked a little bit about an example of one of these already, but were there uh, just different contextual details or discoveries you made throughout your studies this last week in preparation for this that kind of stood out to you as notable? Yeah, I, I continue to ponder... I'll say the potential um, significance of the intentionality of this being revealed to the shepherds. Yeah. I say potential just because, like, I'm not God. But all signs would point to this as a recurring pattern and something that he did to show, like, everybody that this is good news for them. Yes. To show anyone that's going through any plight that joy is available to them. Yep. When I was in Sierra Leone, I never experienced joy like I witnessed the people there having. Mm. It wasn't their circumstances. It was their depth of intimacy and acknowledgement of their source yeah. of, of joy and provision. And instead of coming into every day with an attitude of lack and entitlement, like, I'm frustrated with God because I don't have more. It's I am rejoicing in God for every bit, every kernel of whatever that I do have, yeah. right? And um, 
in preparing for the message, I was going through my archive of photos and videos from there trying to find one that would illustrate it. And I realized that the moments that the memories I have that most illustrated that I was too engulfed in those moments, I didn't even capture them. Mm. And so I just continued to ponder that like, whoa, in a day where everything is captured and presented on social media, all of our best moments, like... The, but the, the best moments actually compel us to engage rather than try to, like, I, I don't know. I'm still thinking through it, and yeah. I don't have the words, but it just really hit me. It's like, and, and emotionally hit me, like, whoa, here I am. I'm like, oh, what's a good example of this? You know, like, for instance, in a service there in Africa, a church service, they do offering, like, three different times. Wow. And it's not, like, pass the plate three times. It's aisle by aisle with music rocking, people dancing up with whatever they can give, just rejoicing in the opportunity to give to what God is doing. And I was like, this makes no sense. Like, one, I was this big white dude from the Northwest that, like, I don't know how to dance anyway. Right. And they're like, come on, pastor, come on. I'm like, okay, I Channel my hitch, you know, keep the elbows <laughs> pinned by the side. So like, no, it's not like that there. Yeah. Um, do the grocery cart. Right? Yeah. I was you like, know? do I do the lawnmower on my way up there? <laughs> like, what, what are we doing? Um, but it, it just, it really hit me that yeah. those moments were so engaging and the joy of the Lord was so strong that I, it never crossed. And I'm like, oh, I need to get a video of this. It yeah. was, I need to fully engage and be, be a part of it in this moment. And so I, I just, I wonder what that looks like for us and as a leader and, somebody who desires for the joy of the Lord to permeate the culture and the atmosphere wherever, you know, we gather um, or in my home or whatever it is, how, how do you replicate that in a place where we have so much yeah. and where our, our culture has told us, like, no, you capture every good moment so you can show it off yeah. rather than set that aside and fully receive what God has for you in no, any given good. moment. and. Uh, so yeah, that's not really a hey. Here's another preach point. It's just a something to think about. Oh, that's great. It's, it's been hitting me. So oh, that's really good. Are there any additional thoughts or ideas just as we kind of wrap up? Not only just our conversation on this message, but really like conversations around Advent as a whole. You yeah, know, we're not we're not done with Christmas themed things quite yet, but this we're is kind of the end. And of And I our, think our Christmas Eve Eve service. I think I feel compelled to touch on that point of joy, the culmination of Advent in joy in the birth of Jesus, and almost like a, a quick re-summary yeah. of, of what we've done and culminating that night. <coughs> Sorry, I should have brought a glass of water. But the, the double extended cut. <coughs> the extend, yeah, the <laughs> extended part due. Um, but on this question, you had a great thought on that as we were you know offline just going over this. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Just like... A lot of this message definitely looked, you know, in a more reflective mm-hmm. fashion. And you said, gosh, there's a lot that, that we can talk about that's significant just in a forward-looking fashion, too. And I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as, as we've referenced throughout this Advent sermon series, so much of the point of Advent is to look back in order to look forward. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I just loved your four points. Jesus is king, he's savior, he's redeemer, he's hero. Like, he's been all of those things, and he's also all of those things moving forward. Yeah. Like, in a really active sense that we can trust and rely on today as we're walking out our lives, um, but also as we look ahead. And that informs how we can react and respond to the situations of our lives is like, like we've talked about a couple times with these themes, like there's this often we need this perspective shift Mm -hmm. to look above our, uh, our circumstances, to look above our situations. And while maybe it's, it's very common in uh, some Christian cultures to go a little overboard on like looking so much ahead to the day of Jesus that you completely neglect your day-to-day life today because in you the just mission he's given you yeah, in the meantime. Cause yeah. Because you're just you're just hoping he shows up tomorrow and you don't have to worry about We've it. We've all kind talked of to thing. those people, right? How are you just waiting for Jesus to come back tomorrow? Yesterday, anytime now. Yeah. Like, yep. What are you doing in the meantime? Exactly. Yeah. But but then we also we uh, we're in danger of going too far away from that truth and and forgetting the significance that like Jesus is going to return mm-hmm. and he's going to fulfill everything that he started like this inaugurated kingdom that we get to see bits and pieces of now is going to arrive in its fullness when he comes back mm-hmm. and and um that should cause us 
uh, joy mm-hmm. in in moments of hardship, in moments of stress, in moments where we're feeling so overwhelmed. When we step back, when we lift our eyes above the circumstances, like we end up seeing that, like, wow, this is just a blip in the in the entirety of the the timeline that I'm going to live in in eternity with God because. He is returning because he is still our king. He's still our savior. He still redeems. He's still the hero. And that inspires a hope and a joy and, and peace and love and all these different kinds of things while we're in the midst of waiting for it. Um, because it, it speaks to a much bigger thing that's coming um, that will uh, really like, you know, things that feel so weighty and significant. Now we're going to look back on when we're in eternity with Christ and be like, man, if I would have only known that that was like going to be as small as it was yeah. or it was going to be as short as it yeah. was and because yeah. really God's right. going to redeem all those things. Yeah, well, that's really good. It's, uh, I think, inherent in our individual nature, we tend to often default to looking back in a reflective yeah. manner or looking forward. I think like most people, it's like you always have the this or that type of yes. scenarios and usually we're wired to do one or the other. And um, I think it's another one of those things that we just have to pray for God to help us find the tension of like, yeah, yeah. we reflect and, and appreciate, um, but also be looking forward to that. And then between the reflection and the forward looking is smack dab in the middle where Jesus has placed us to be intentional and on mission and like bridging that gap, right? Yeah. Like full of his Holy Spirit, full of his mission and his standing orders here on earth. And um, so we don't reflect or look forward to get caught up. We yeah. look, we reflect and look forward so that those things hold us in a healthy tension of mission and discipleship and loving what God loves. Yeah. And for me, that's what I come into Christmas to celebrate. Yeah. And um, I'm praying that as we've taken time to go through these Advent themes and really focused on that, that um, the family moments that are had within our church and anyone else that's been listening um, will also uh, find a way to yeah. be um, to revolve around those those themes and that attitude. And instead of I want to go deal with my crazy aunt this Christmas, it's like my aunt needs to hear this. Yeah. Um, how can I be the living embodiment of these things to my family and plant seeds that may be harvested today, maybe in a decade, but we trust God with that harvest. Amen. That's my hope for us for this season. Amen. Well, I think that's, <coughs> that's probably a good place to wrap up our conversation I think so. today. Cool. I think so. Well, thanks for tuning in with us today. Uh, we've got a couple more things coming out this week. Obviously, we've got our Christmas Eve's Eve service on Thursday. We'd love to have you join us with that. If you are somebody, maybe you've been tuning into these kinds of conversations, you don't live in the Eugene area, you can find that on our Facebook and YouTube mm-hmm. channels as well. Uh, but we'd love to really pack out that room and have a great evening of scripture reading and Christmas carols and all that. Uh, we'll have a special message and, and some worship songs coming out on Sunday, no in-person service. And then actually next week, we're going to be taking the week off from all of our normal podcast rhythms, just as we kind of uh, enjoy some family time, some downtime. And uh, so we'd encourage you to go back through and listen to some of the other content from this rest of the month, catch up on anything you missed. Um, But yeah, so stay involved on social media, keep plugged in, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. See you later.